All right. A scene from the classic, Legally Blonde, uh, to share with you guys. And, you know, the thing that I love in that movie is that as uh, unusual as she is and, and different that she is from her surroundings, the one thing that is true about her is that from the beginning to the end, she is who she is. What you see is what you get. All that pink, the little puppy, the car, everything about her, that's, that's really who she is. And in fact, what we find out as we watch this film is that she is one of the most authentic people in the, in the entire film. She, that character is truly that person. You know, and the fact is, is that from the inside out, she represents herself very accurately, very well. There is nothing hidden in her life. How many people can you say that about? That what you see is what you get. That they really are who they say they are. That they do what they say. You know, that's something that we've talked about over the years, about the importance of being congruent, congruent, excuse me, congruent, Let, letting your outsides match your insides and your insides match your outsides. Having that integrity of walking the walk that you talk. On Route 40, this journey of the mind, body, and spirit is exactly that. It's an, an integrity building experience. It's a refreshment, a renewing of our commitment to Christ, a renewing of our personal commitment to, to caring for the body and the spirit and the mind that God has blessed us with. And then engaging that in the world with the goal of having a positive impact on those around us, of sharing the transformational gospel of Jesus Christ, and watching lives and people being healed by God's presence. Having that commitment, being bold in our faith. Because you know when we turn to the book of Revelations, one of my favorite texts, there's that quote in Revelations that says, I want, I want someone hot or cold. But if you're lukewarm... I will spit you out. What an image. It's kind of like a Major League Baseball player getting ready to pitch. That's what Christ says about us. If we are lukewarm. Route 40 is about being bold. Building ourselves so that we can serve. And take risks. Those risks that bring great reward. In service of Christ. Route 40. I hope all of you are, are watching those video devotionals that we're putting out. Hopefully they've had an impact and they've, they've helped you on your journey. I hope you're consistently praying in the morning when you wake up, praying at night before you go to sleep. I hope you're actually listening to the devotionals and then going straight to Scripture and reading the text for yourself. I hope you're continuing to challenge yourself. How can I make an impact? How can I add value today? to this week, to the people in my lives and the people around me. I hope you're doing all of those things as you grow closer to Christ. Because the amazing thing is, this is really a phenomenal statement, I know I'm really going out on a limb, but if we act Christ-like, we grow closer to Him. Amazing, isn't it? If we... If we watch what Christ does, and we take those actions and bring them into our lives, we look more, I mean, we become more Christ-like. We become closer to Christ. I'm telling you, it's way better than growing a beard and growing your hair long. That does nothing to make you Christ-like. What makes you Christ-like is walking His walk. I have a question for you guys as you consider your own journey on Route 40 and how you draw closer to Christ. I have a question for you guys. What comes to your mind when I say this phrase? First thing that pops in your head. The great one. Gretzky. Wayne Gretzky. Wayne Gretzky. What else? Anything else pop in your head? The great one. God. World War II. World War II. The great one. Someone said God back there. That's not what I'm asking for. The, what, what comes to our mind, honestly, what came to my mind when I thought to myself the great one was Wayne Gretzky, because that was his nickname, while the hockey player. The next one I thought of the great one, Muhammad Ali came to mind, you know, one of the greatest boxers of all time. 
Because he, he told us all the time. I mean, we, we, we knew because he told us. He was also a pretty good boxer. The great one, I thought, I thought of athletes. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. You know, I bet you most of you, when you've thought of greatness, you may have thought of, of someone in a genre like athlete, athletics, or you may have thought of someone in the music area, like a great, a great singer or something like that, a great guitarist, or maybe you, know, you thought of someone who was an author, you know, greatness, because we reward all those people that provide us really cool stuff, like books and music and sports. And don't get me wrong, those things are wonderful things to have part of our lives. But when we think of greatness, I guarantee you 95% of us, or 99% of us, maybe there's one of you in here, I thought of something different than the greatest athlete, or the greatest singer, or the greatest writer, or the greatest scientist. I bet you very few of us thought of the greatest servant leader, the greatest servant, the one who gave more of themselves than they received. You know, it's funny, when, when, when we think of sports as greatness, when we think of, of rewards as greatness, I mean, all we, when we think of, all we have to think about is like all the big parades. Who do they have a parade for? They must be great. They have a parade for Santa Claus. He must be great. They have a parade for, parade for the World Series winners, the, the uh, football champions, the, uh, the uh, winners of the NBA uh, playoffs. They have parades. They, they must be great. In reality, Christ confronts the way we reward greatness, confronts what we measure as great, confronts those people who think they are great directly in Scripture. When we turn to Matthew 23, verses 1 through 12, listen to these words and Christ's confrontation. These are his words. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, a position of great honor. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for men to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor and banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted in the marketplace and have men call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have only one master, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you will be your servant, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. That kind of flips things a little bit upside down when we think about greatness and the way we honor greatness. We honor achievement. We honor excellence. We honor, uh, we honor skill and, and originality. And we honor, what does Christ say? Honor the servant. Honor the one who humbles himself before God. That is what greatness is. Let's use that as a litmus test. Who are the great ones in our world? Who are the great people that you know? Unfortunately for me, that list shrinks significantly when I use Jesus' litmus test for greatness. When I use our world's measure for greatness, wow, I could just rattle them off one by one. Great comedians, great actors, great actresses, all this stuff. But all of a sudden, when I'm forced to say, who are the greatest servants? Wow. Mm. I have to think a lot harder about that. <laughs> 